It's my pleasure to introduce our next uh, panel. Um, I'll introduce them obviously in their, um, um, in their scheduled talks. Heather Love teaches English and Gender Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of Feeling Backward, Lost in the Politics of Queer History from Harvard. As many of you know, it's massively influential work in um, recent queer studies. She's the editor of a special issue of GLQ and Gail Rubin entitled Rethinking Sex, and the co-editor of a special issue of Representations entitled Description Across Disciplines. She's recently published essays in Differences and Modern Language Quarterly on issues of deviance, normativity, anti-normativity, and scale. Currently, she's completing a book on practices of description of the humanities and social sciences. Her talk is entitled The Natural History of Attention. Amanda Anderson is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Humanities and English and the director of the Kogut Center for the Humanities at Brown. She's the author of Bleak Liberalism, uh, just out from Chicago. The Way We Argue Now, a study in the cultures of theory from Princeton, the powers of distance, cosmopolitanism, and the cultivation of detachment, also from Princeton, and Tainted Souls and Painted Faces, the rhetoric of fallenness in Victorian culture from Cornell. She delivered the Clarendon Lectures in English at Oxford in 2015, and the book derived from those lectures, Psych and Ethos, Moral Life After Psychology, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Her talk is entitled, The Scale of Attention. Heather? OK, thanks so much. This is an amazing conference and super timely. Um, so I look forward to our panel and the rest of the day. So in this uh, recent issue of representations uh, that I edited with Sharon Marcus and Stephen Best, we offered a hypothesis that every discipline includes approaches or activities that are more descriptive and less conceptual in nature, and that although this work is considered necessary, even foundational, it tends to be less valued, less respected, and less highly compensated than theoretical work. Prevailing attitudes to description, we wrote, situate it as the kind of grunt work that people overlook or belittle, but without which they could not function. Attending to the conceptual and descriptive poles within disciplines, I argue, offers a different map of disciplinary conflict, supplementing the familiar account of hierarchy among the disciplines with an account of the hierarchies internal to disciplines. I think such a framework might allow scholars in the humanities to forge alliances with scholars in other fields who engage in detailed practices of observation and description, or what the anthropologist Anna Singh calls the arts of noticing. Now, a more familiar way to trace such alliances would be through a commitment to interpretation, not description. The suggestion that scholars in the interpretive disciplines are natural allies with those who care about narrative, language, textuality, experience. That's fine. That's clearly a, an important site of alliance um, and interdisciplinary work. I'm doing something different. And I want to turn from uh, concepts, say, for instance, like representation or narrative or textuality, to practice, and in particular to attention as the basis for alliance, drawing together scholars who are invested in the arts of noticing and thus who are at some distance from what Amanda yesterday described as outcome-oriented models. Humanists, I suspect, are likely to agree with me about the importance of the arts of noticing, but may not be willing to recognize such methods out of place as they appear in the sciences and the social sciences. These are fields where it's proven hard to find the love. Is my PowerPoint on? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, these are fields, natural sciences, social sciences, where it's been hard to find the love. Humanities scholars associate these fields more readily with violence, knowledge extraction, and social control. But it's love and attention that I'm after. <laughs> Jeff, you like that? <laughs> we were talking about that yesterday, I think. Um, the protagonist of my talk is the Dutch ethologist or animal behaviorist, Nicolas Tinbergen, who wore his heart on his sleeve in his writing. For instance, in his 1958 book, Curious Naturalists, 
um, in which he details his love for Hulshorst, the coastal area of Holland where he spent time as a child and undertook his first natural history studies of wasps. According to Tinbergen, the barren landscape, a mixture of scrub pines, heather, and sandy, hoil, sandy soil is sparsely populated because it is seen as good for nothing by most. But Tinbergen, having spent decades in Hulshorst, warns the reader not to accept this view. But don't think that this country was dull, far from it. Long walks reveal many hidden treasures, including honey buzzards and woodcock, edible mushrooms, and roe deer. Quote, the Scots pine, pine plantations, at first glance so monotonous, were full of fascinating creatures, many of them beautifully camouflaged. And even the bare sandy stretches had a charm of their own. The charm of Holshorst is elusive, requiring close attention on the part of the child, the naturalist, naturalist and the reader. Tinbergen writes, we lived in that country long enough to see it in a great variety of circumstances and moods, and gradually every part of it acquired significance. The whole area became charged with our experiences, which I shall never forget. Um, I just want to briefly note these, um, these, are, these images are from, these are Tinberg's, Tinbergen's drawings. I'm going to show a few of them. These and the letters that I'm going to cite from um, all come from the Bodleian Library at Oxford, from the Tinbergen papers that are housed there. And I want to thank David Russell for facilitating my visit to see this uh, wonderful material. So Tinbergen is remembered primarily for his remarkable abilities as an observer of nature. Um, his conceptual breakthroughs related to wasps, gulls, and fish, and specifically about signaling mechanisms in animal communication, are less discussed than his abilities in the field, his remarkable eye for detail, and his species sense, by which is understood both an appreciation of the whole animal, but also an ability to see the complexity of animal and an animal's behavior in a dynamic environment. There are endless testimonies, testimonies to Tinbergen's fine eye, even among scientists who disregarded or diminished his findings. Now, it's possible you guys will stop um, agreeing with me about this thesis about um, descriptive work being undervalued when I tell you that Tinbergen won the Nobel Prize in 1973. The category was physiology or medicine. He won it with Carl Frisch and their far more famous colleague, Conrad Lawrence. We can understand Lawrence's fame as a function of his willingness to venture bold claims about animal behavior, claims that Tinbergen often felt to be overblown, sometimes plagiarized from Tinbergen, and in many cases just mistaken. In a letter from Tinbergen to Richard Burkhart, who wrote uh, this wonderful book about Tinbergen and ethology called Patterns of Behavior, uh, Tinbergen wrote to, to Burkhart, quote, Lawrence tended to sketch things in broad, sweeping outlines, whereas I filled in the grand outline with, if you wish, the details. Tinbergen's odd status when the, within the history of modern biology is linked to the fate of natural history across the 20th century. What had once been an epic project, nursed in the heart of empire, to identify and classify all of God's creation and to profit from it, became by the 20th century an odd footnote, the province of amateurs, enthusiasts, and the subject of popular entertainment. Charles Elton's 1927 book, Animal Ecology, is generally understood to mark the transition from 18th and 19th century forms of natural history to the 20th century emphasis on experiment, modeling, and quantification. Elton cleared the way for a newly professional field, defining the field of ecology as, quote, scientific natural history, and bemoaning the mania for collecting and identifying specimens, which yields, quote, records of less value than the paper upon which they were written. Elton describes the huge descriptive efforts of local natural history societies, collectors, and pre-scientific field naturalists as foundational to the work of ecologists in providing them the raw material for classifying animals, and he looks forward to a future in which the task of the systematist or taxonomist collector will, quote, become more and more that of the man who identifies specimens for other people. So the situation of interdependence and rivalry that we see in Elton, and I think um, ecology is one of these fields that has really clearly a kind of descriptive and um, conceptual pull, flared up across the 20th century and in the 21st century. And there's been a recent flare up. The small scale and time consuming nature <clears throat> of descriptive research um, have made it especially vulnerable in the moment of climate change and, uh, and environmental crisis. Uh, 
mathematical modeling and big data seem more obviously suited for the scale of the catastrophe. Yet ecologists argue that descriptive research is more important than ever. They argue that intimate familiarity with organisms is necessary to promote the goal of conservation. It's also a matter of documenting the species that are disappearing really quickly. But they also argue that large-scale models don't do a good job of accounting for human uh, effects. So there is evidence of a resurgence of natural history methods in the present. Nonetheless, descriptive research remains undervalued and underfunded according to the people who practice it. Um, and it's saying, makes an extended plea for the value of observation and description in an age of environmental destruction in her 2015 book, The Mushroom at the End of the World. Singh considers the, quote, arts of living on a damaged planet, refusing both progressive views of history and melancholy despair about the future. Chief among these arts of living is the art of noticing. The curiosity I advocate, Singh writes, follows multiple temporalities, revitalizing description and imagination. This is not a simple empiricism in which the world invents its own categories. Instead, agnostic about where, where we are going, we might look for what has been ignored for, quote, world-making projects, both human and not human. Singh opposes natural history to neoclassical economics and population genetics, two fields that profit, in her view, from the scalability of their object. That's to say the kind of rational man, individual actor. She writes, noticing is unnecessary to track these unchanging individuals. Mathematics can replace natural history and ethnography. Singh is looking for methods attuned to what she calls the indeterminate encounter. Using a mix of ethnography and natural history, Singh tra tracks the lifeways of Mian foragers in the mountains of Oregon and the intricate, non-scalable ecologies of Matsutake mushrooms foraging in a complex forest. And, and she argues that foraging in a complex forest ecology can teach us how to, quote, look around rather than ahead. Now, Tinbergen was a passionate advocate of looking around. And his work was significant in the context of a move in the post-war period to embrace natural history methods across several fields. Um, so one important example of this is a, a project that I've written on already called Natural History of an Interview, started by Frieda Fromm Reichman, Gregory Bateson, involving people like Bird Whistle. Um, it's also being written about by uh, Seth Water, who's a MCM graduate student here. It's an amazing piece that's coming out in Gray Room. In his 1966 essay, Natural History Method in Psychotherapy, Communicational Research, Albert Shefflin bemoans the fact that scientific method proceeds by, quote, selecting some element of an item under study, separating this item from the larger whole, and examining the abstracted elements in isolation. This world of bits and pieces, as Shefflin calls it, seems unfamiliar to the clinician who has experienced the unity and flow of the psychotherapeutic session. For Tinberg, in learning to see the unity and flow in natural environments was a lifelong project. It was also the basis for his extensive training of researchers in the field. In his 1953 book, Social Behavior in Animals, he offers practical and theoretical suggestions for how to do fieldwork. The need for a broad observational approach cannot be stressed too much. The natural tendency of many people, particularly of young beginners, is to concentrate on an isolated problem and try to penetrate into it. This laudable inclination must be kept in check, or else it leads to an accumulation of partial, disconnected results to a collection of sociological oddities. Um, I should say he's actually engaging in this really interesting project in the 50s called animal sociology. Um, so a kind of interesting meshing between animal behavior and, and sociology. A broad descriptive reconnaissance of the whole system of phenomena is necessary in order to see each individual problem in perspective. It's the only safeguard for a balanced approach in which analytical and synthetical thinking can cooperate. This, of course, is true not only of sociology, it is true of each science, but in ethology and sociology it is perhaps forgotten more often than in either. Sorry, that's a typo there. Although looking around sounds simple, in some ways easier than the kind of meticulous focus study we associate with professional scholarship of all kinds, Tinberg always insisted on its difficulty, stressing just how much we don't see and how much there is to gain from looking again and again. Um, these are some drawings that he did for um, some children's books that he 
published early in his career. Tinbergen's writing, both published and unpublished, includes accounts of almost fantastically extended acts of attention, often sitting in an uncomfortable position for days at a time, watching while nothing happens. In Hull's Horse, Tinbergen discovers an area of a high concentration of wasps and begins watching them, observing their homing and hunting behavior. But the work is filled with setbacks and dull periods. He writes, I decided to spend a season watching the hunting wasps. This was easier said than done. There were a couple thousand wasps about it, is true, but a first reconnaissance showed that they did their hunting over a very wide area, half a square mile or so. In spite of hours watching at the nearest apiary, I never saw a wasp come anywhere near the hives. Throughout the process, Tinbergen struggles to find feasible alternatives to pure observation, given his realization that, quote, it would not be possible, or at least would cost an amount of time out of all proportion, to go and watch the hunting wasps in the field but he does go watch the hunting wasps in the field. <laughs> he goes to the wasp hunting grounds, um, and he does eventually observe their feeding behavior using a combination of methods, some pure obs purely observational and some experimental. But the core of his practice is field study, watching and waiting. At the end of the section on hunting behavior, Tinbergen writes, it had taken us five summers to build up this picture of the life of the bee killer, admittedly a long time. <laughs> but, but this type of work always proceeds slowly with setbacks caused by, caused by bad weather, lack of control over animals in the wild, and so many other handicaps inherent to field work. Yet it would have been impossible to do these things in the laboratory. It was a matter of doing it in the field or not doing it at all. Now the charm of these anecdotes and Tinbergen's writing is considerable, and um, Tinbergen um, achieves success. You just notice that almost all of these images feature kind of um, instances of attention on behalf of a, you know, a young naturalist, um, sort of classic trope of naturalist autobiography. But that's really kind of each picture. Um, Tinbergen achieved um, some success as a popular nature writer and as a documentary filmmaker, right? So he's kind of part of the story of the popularization of natural history nature films in the second half of the 20th century. And to some extent, Tinbergen is most interesting as a hero of attention and is a significant figure, I think, in a story about the fate of natural history across the 20th century as an art of noticing. But his significance for us, I think, is more vexed because he turned this attention uh, late in his career to human subjects. Um, and this is really more what I'm working on in the chapter of the book. Tinbergen's natural history fieldwork directly informed his research on childhood autism that he conducted with his wife Elizabeth in the 1970s and early 1980s. This resulted in two books, um, Early Childhood Autism, An Ethological Approach from 1972, and Autistic Children, New Hope for a Cure from 1986. This research is challenging for many reasons. It's been challenged by many people in the autism community, but I think it's important to frame it in the context of a broader merger of animal behaviorism and studies of man in the period. Here's another example from Nicholas Blurton Jones, um, his Ethological Studies of Child Behavior. It's from 1972. Tinbergen wrote the introduction to this book in which he comments that, quote, a new type of research worker is busy building the foundations of a science by returning with renewed attention and interest in detail to the basic task of observation and description of the natural phenomena that have to be understood. Tim Berger just said these words over and over again, right? This is the quality of attention that he's trying to get people to pay. Tim Berger voiced his traditional resistance to laboratory research and his skepticism about psychology as a whole, which was marked. Laboratory and experimental research, he wrote, on essentially human problems um, leads to the preoccupation with too few phenomena and too few methods. He also stresses that the synthesis of ethology with the human sciences should not be about analogy, but rather shared practices. So the negative examples here would be like Lawrence on aggression or Desmond Morris on the naked ape, right? It's not like men are like animals. It's about shared methods, shared practices. Rather than extrapolating interpretations from animals to man, Tinbergen writes, a growing number of young ethologists have themselves begun to collect factual information about man's behavior using ethological methods. In Early Childhood Autism, the book from 72, the Tinbergens argue for the usefulness of ethology 
for the study of children, and for the entire field of psychology, which they write, makes, quote, surprisingly little use of the basic scientific method of straightforward observation. The book begins with an account of the criteria used for the diagnosis of autism, a list punctuated by discussions of impairment, pathology, and abnormality. For the Tinbergens, observation is not undertaken in the service of diagnosis, and extended looking for them tends to blur out differences between normal and abnormal children. Through um, acts of observation undertaken in the everyday spaces of Oxford, um, buses, grocery stores, living rooms, they turned the city into their field. Watching children interacting in such spaces persuaded them that there was a continuum between ordinary shyness and autism, noting that, and they noted that, quote, all phenomena described of autistic children can be observed in normal children. So this focus on visible behavior and observation in the field universalized autism for the Tinbergens. They eventually came to describe all children's behavior as at some point temporarily autistic. Now, again, this is not the direction, direction that autism research has taken after this moment, uh, but I continue to see value in the de-essentializing and depathologizing thrust of the Tinbergen's research on autism. It's more difficult, I think, to deal with Tinbergen's understanding of human action as behavior. I think this is actually the, the sort of sticking point for us. So I'm going to head to my conclusion now, and I want to reflect as I close on what might lie beyond the reach of natural history. Let's say a lot of things that you guys have been talking about over the last day and a half. Um, and um, basically to briefly consider the significance of observational research in the exploration of psychic experience. So it's controversial in many circles to suggest that human activity, activity is behavior. The tension between behavior and symbolic activity has been um, the heart of many debates across the 20th century. I, I think that those questions are heightened and intensified in discussions of psychic content um, in which we address, we address not only you know, humans' ability as makers of meaning and symbols, but also the problem of the unconscious. Uh, Wilfred Bion meditates at length on this question and attention interpretation in the analytic situation he writes, the evidence of the senses will only get us so far, since psychoanalytic material has no taste, or feel, or smell, or visible appearance. For this reason, the mental domain should not be subject to factual treatment. This is beyond. An advantage of believing that observations are the foundation of scientific method is that the conditions in which they are made can be stated and then produced. An analytic situation is presumed to exist and interpretations of the observations made in that situation are then reported. But for beyond behavior frame, basically all the components of this supposed uh, fact of this interaction are abrogated by the special circumstances of psychic life. He writes, I cannot observe Mr. X because he will not remain inside the analytic situation or even within Mr. X himself. Given this state of affairs, Bion asks, how are we to observe and record the patient's state of mind? Most broadly, he replies that the evidence of the sense, what the evidence of the senses is to the scientist, intuition is to the analyst. But if we have a colloquial sense of what intuition might look like in this situation or any other, Bion, I think, destroys it by probing the paradox of what it means to see, quote, something that differs from what is normally known as reality. In questing after the non-existent, what he calls the non-existent, non-existent, one breaks one's relationship with facts as generally understood. Beyond cites a letter from Freud who offers a model of attunement to psychic experience. Freud writes that to practice analysis, he had to quote, blind myself artificially to focus all the light on one dark spot. Beyond takes the statement as a basis for his own practice, quote, the piercing shaft of darkness can be directed on the dark features of the analytic situation. This is hardly the method that we associate with the post-war microanalysts, for whom adequate lighting, as well as visual aids such as the film camera, the slow motion analyzers, and the flatbed editor were indispensable. Beyond defines the work of analysis as a dark art, but it's a dark art of observation, I want to suggest. 
Through what he calls an act of faith, one can, quote, see, hear, and feel the mental phenomenon of whose reality no practicing psychoanalyst has any doubt, though he cannot with any accuracy re represent them by existing formulations. Beyond account of the analyst's discipline, how he comes to be a good observer of those of psychic life recalls the vir modestus, the figure that Donna Haraway identifies as the self-denying subject of scientific experiment. To attain the state of mind essential for the practice of psychoanalysis, I avoid any exercise of memory. I make no notes. When I am tempted to remember the events of any particular session, I resist the temptation. If I find that some half memory is beginning to obtrude, I resist its recall, no matter how pressing or desirable its recall may seem to be. A similar procedure is followed with regard to desires. I avoid entertaining desires and attempt to dismiss them from my mind. It is not enough to try to do this in the session because that is too late. The habit of desiring must not be allowed to grow. For example, I think it is a serious defect to allow oneself to desire the end of a session or week or term. It interferes with the analytic work to permit desires for the patient's cure or well-being or future to enter the mind. In light of this account, Beyond's use of an epigraph for attention and interpretation from Bacon's Novum Organum about the two ways of seeking and finding truth, one which flies from general axioms to the particulars, and the other, the true one, which collects axioms from senses and particulars, let's say the deductive versus the inductive, seems less ironic and more descriptive. Psychoanalysis here is an art of observation with the same conditions and prerogatives of other practices of observation, only distinguished by the fact that it turns its attention to the non-existent. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here. What resources do literary critics bring to their objects of study? For many years, I would have had no hesitation in answering attunement to the vibrations of the non-existent. In her um, contribution to this description issue of representations called Observable Behavior 1 through 10, the filmmaker, director, Liza Johnson, comments, uh, comments on the pliancy and capaciousness of observation. She writes, some people rely a lot on observing behavior. Everyone does it, but not everyone does it in the same way, and not everyone is good at it. At least in my experience, if you're an outsider, if you're outside a culture or a friend group, or in figurative, figurative or literal ways you don't speak the language, you must rely on observing behavior. It makes other people think you have ESP, when in fact you are really using sensory perception in a way that the culture would prefer you didn't. It is said that the children of addicts and other erratic parties are especially good at this kind of observation, of reading all the surfaces of the world all the time. I like to think of it as a special skill that is learned eccentrically outside the academy. Johnson insists that even the keenest powers of observation are sensory rather than extra sensory. This formula, I think, this formulation helps me to account for my recent detour into observational research, otherwise somewhat perplexing, giving my extensive training in and attachment to the dark arts. It surprised me as much as everybody else, I guess. I would suggest that my ability to direct a dark shaft of attention toward things unseen um, was an effect, Liza's passage makes me think this, of things that I actually saw happen. I might also say experience, since what we are talking about is the evidence of the senses, which can take many forms. But as it happened, I mostly watched things happen in a frame that has a name, witness to violence, though I'm also backing away from the language of witness for reasons that are probably obvious. Johnson's article helps me to see psychic material not as sequestered content, but instead as a, a, a kind of stop in a sequence or circuit of behavior. A passage, the passage from looking around in an environment charged with violence to looking around at a clinical situation, a meadow, or any social scene, fictional or otherwise, might pass through the dark spot that Freud describes, but it doesn't revolve around it. One final example, and this is Tinberg in a drawing of uh, the naturalist and the bird blind. Uh, this is an outtake of Tinberg in Psychic Life played as was characteristic for him in the key of the ordinary. Late in their autism research, the Tinbergens became involved with Martha Welch, 
um, a passionate advocate of holding therapy as a treatment for autism and other psychic matters, problems. The Tinbergens allied themselves with Welch, and this explains the subtitle of their second book on autism, New Hope for a Cure. That's say the cure with holding. Um, and this is, they thus allied themselves with a treatment now widely seen not only as ineffective, but also as cruel since it was non-consensual holding mostly of parents by, of children by their, their parents, of autistic children by their parents and mostly their mothers. But um, Welch and the Tinbergen strongly believed in the therapeutic power of touch and um, sought to get many different things out of it and engaged in it themselves. On November 21st, 1982, Welch wrote to Tinbergen about his um, chronic depression, recurrent chronic depression and general poor health. Nico, however happy your childhood may have been, it is certain that you did not get enough touch, holding, affection. You have had, in addition to whatever early trauma or lack, an extremely traumatic adult life. Um, and Tinbergen was um, a prisoner of war, war during World War II. There's some writing about that. Welch counseled the Tinbergens to do a daily hold of 45 minutes, arguing that it would bring up buried psychic content that needed to be surfaced and would also help them to resolve deep conflicts um, between each, with each other. And the Tinbergens agreed to do that. On 17th of December, a month later, roughly, Tinberg, Tinbergen reports back, quote, as to our own holding exercise, we find it helpful and do it practically every day for 30 to 60 minutes. Comments by elderly people, we soon get cramp, stiff necks, and painful backs, <laughs> but we can manage by shifting positions. No personal grievances or confessions flow to the surface, but then we have, after all, lived together for over 50 years and have, have talked out our emotionally tinted clashes. On some differences, we agree to disagree, and we can't get worked up about them. But it does help us to relax and turn our attention away from the outside world and upon each other, which we both find extremely constructive. We often begin to yawn and fall nearly asleep. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that amazing talk, Heather. This paper will address questions of method and theory in literary studies, with particular emphasis, partly by way of example, on the implications for study of the novel. I'm interested primarily in what I see as an underexplored question about attention and scale. One of the features of several notable manifestos about method published since the turn of the century by Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, Stephen Best and Sharon Marcus, and Rita Felsky is an urging to engage with works of literature more immediately or directly, to relinquish the tendency to step back and judge them through distancing frames of analysis. The, dis the distancing move has characteristically been associated also with ideology critique and with forms of suspicious reading above all. In fact, reading these manifestos, one would be prompted to assume that ideology critique was the dominant form of scholarship in the literary field for some decades. And given Sedgwick's prominence as a critic of the novel, and Frederick Jameson's prominence in the story told by Best and Marcus, it would seem, moreover, that ideology critique has reigned supreme, especially in novel studies. I happen to believe that the case against suspicion is overstated, and that one could quite plausibly claim that there were at least as many scholars arguing against suspicious models as producing them in the past four decades. But I'm not going to talk about that. Today I'm going to suggest that we pay attention to a somewhat different dimension of the story, one that shadows the rise and fall of certain methods and theories, and also the embrace and disavowal of suspicion, but has a different resonance and set of effects 
This story is about the rise of what I will call therapeutic criticism. And telling the story through this lens will, it is my wager, highlight the relation between different scales of attention. I hope to show how a certain contraction to the scenes of immediate engagement with objects and other persons can, in certain of its formations, present an opportunity to rethink attention on a larger scale. A good place to begin is with the publication of Foucault's History of Sexuality, Volume 1, published in France in 1976 and translated into English in 1978. This volume, which has had a formidable influence on literary studies, described a form of power that worked precisely through an incitement to discourse, including the talking cure, which it viewed within an essentially functionalist model. Subjects were kept docile in part through the distractions of endlessly talking about themselves. One primary scene for such an understanding of distracted interiority was, of course, the therapeutic situation. In its account of the rise of a discourse of sexuality, Foucault's book covers an extensive cultural historical domain encompassing a vast interlocking network of disciplines, institutions, and knowledges. To the extent that it discusses therapeutic culture, the History of Sexuality, Volume 1, offers a critique of that culture and the psychoanalytic assumptions that underpin it, including, most famously, the repressive hypothesis. Yet in producing a description of the forces that have led to the development of therapeutic practices and in interesting its readers in the operation of those forces, it neither offers nor imagines an escape from that culture, despite, despite fleeting references to the potentiality of a reverse discourse or implicitly unconstrained bodies and pleasures. And in fact, Foucault's own turn toward practices of the self seems to underscore the powerful ways in which the project of ongoing self-examination and self-fashioning is unavoidably compelling. D.A. Miller's memorable chapter on David Copperfield in the novel and the police captured the double intensity of critical diagnosis and inevitable self-absorption in a dynamic that I'm going to suggest has had an enduring effect on the field in ways other than imagined by the many critiques of that book. Before tracing this development, however, it's important to put into perspective the claims I will be making. In asking that we focus our attention on the therapeutic, I am precisely not arguing that psychoanalysis as an encompassing theory has had an undue effect on the explanatory frameworks of the field. As Rita Felsky points out in The Limits of Critique, Psychoanalysis has remained a niche activity at the same time that many concepts drawn from it have found their way into the diagnostic categories of the field, prominently including, I would add, those that aim to describe larger systems of power. The very term symptomatic is perhaps the most striking instance, but notions such as homophobia, phallogocentrism, and even cultural anxiety are also reflective of the broader condition in which psychology has influenced criticism. The move was underwritten in a sense by Lacan, who saw the Oedipus complex as describing a general entry into the symbolic order. Quite apart from this discursive and conceptual influence of psychoanalysis on our critical categories, however, a therapeutic impulse could be said to stand behind two distinctive responses to ideological criticism that have formed in the field. The first response is best characterized as an ascesis that willfully reduces the methodological field. The second response promotes a sensitized understanding of critical subjectivity under duress, one in need of repair or mood enhancement. In both cases, strikingly, there is a kind of withdrawal from systems analysis, or at least a pausing of it, even though it is often the case that the power of the system remains fully assumed. In unfolding this argument, I will acknowledge the power of the attention attracting polemics of recent times, but I will accord them a somewhat different meaning than they would claim for themselves. And while each could be said to reflect a therapeutic impulse, they present in very different ways. Foucault's turn from the analysis of disciplinary power to practices of the self 
will serve as the model for one key enactment of this therapeutic turn, one that is modest, method-based, and focused on the cultivation of ethos by the practitioner. The other model, more emphatically and avowedly therapeutic, will be provided by Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's own influential turn from paranoid reading to reparative reading, as outlined in her well-known and highly influential essay, Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, which first appeared as the introduction to Sedgwick's edited collection, Novel Gazing, Queer Readings in Fiction, 1997, and was then reprinted in Touching Feeling, Affect, Pedagogy, Performativity, 2002. That essay, which is viewed as one of the important early documents of what has, been, has come to be known as affect studies, appealed to the psychoanalytic concepts of Melanie Klein to argue for a turn away from dominant forms of suspicious reading. In this account, the relation of the reader critic toward the text is understood through the developmental stages of the infant, and particularly through its negotiation of the death drive. In an attempt to negotiate its own destructive impulses, the infant splits its ego into good and bad parts, which it then projects onto external objects, most famously the mother's breast. This issues in the paranoid schizoid position as the projected bad object is imagined as a persecuting agent. In time, with growing awareness of the conflict between the warring impulses of love and hate, the infant enters into the depressive position, which then prompts a turn toward remorse and repair, one oriented toward objects and persons. It's somewhat hard to tell throughout Sedgwick's essay what the precise relation is between the second order activities of intellection and aesthetic engagement and the first order intersubjective relations. I will return to this issue later. For the moment, however, I wish to underscore that the attention to the relation between an analysis of systemic power here seen to be fueled by paranoia and the more immediately felt conditions faced by situated and vulnerable subjects has had an enduring influence on our critical frameworks of analysis. A more recent study which can be seen as directly expressive of this tendency is Lauren Berlant's Cruel Optimism, which invokes the concept of repair adapted by Sedgwick from Klein, casting it in even more tenuous and vulnerable terms. The dual focus on systemic power and vulnerable subjects should come as no surprise insofar as it joins an age-old object of novelistic studies the individual in society with an updated understanding of precarious subjects in a power-laden system. One interesting aspect of Sedgwick's account is the focused return to a less invoked psychoanalytic figure, Klein, as well as the implied relevance of the lived experience of the critic. In the case of Foucault, a critique of therapeutic culture results in an ascetic attention to method that is simultaneously embraced as a form of self-cultivation. In the case of Sedgwick, a use of psychoanalytic theory mediates the understanding of systemic power in such a way that its structural unavoidability is registered along with the desirability of a reparative response. The formations I'm discussing here belong more to a set the, sorry, the formations I'm discussing here belong more to a set of arguments affecting the methods adopted by the literary field as a whole. But, a, but part of what I'm interested in is the way in which novel studies sparked a response that has had, a much, that has had much broader field effects, a rejection of what was seen as a major form of criticism within theory of the novel, ideological criticism, came to serve as the target and occasion for a necessary field transformation, which in some formations is also a field contraction. Another way in which the history of novel studies will be important to my analysis, moreover, has to do with the connection between the realist ambition to provide a map of the social totality and the similar aims of critical theory, whether in the guise of ideology critique or other forms of system theory. The question of scale is paramount here, as some of the new methodologies focus their attention either on the surface or seek a more engaged and immediate relation to the text, disavowing not merely suspicion, but the idea of a distanced and diagnostic view. 
Ultimately, I will argue, novel studies cannot do without the distanced and diagnostic view, precisely because it, had, it has always been an indelible part of the realist project, one that moreover endures well beyond the time period, roughly the 19th century, that we generally associate with realism. Whether and how that view is indelibly suspicious or paranoid is a more complicated matter. In a critique of the new formalism in the most recent uh, issue of Critical Inquiry, Jonathan Kramnik and Nanahid Nersessian speak somewhat disparagingly of what they see as an emphasis on attention in some of the new polemics advocating for more modest engagements with textual objects. For Kramnik and Nersessian, methodology can and should be clarified without distracting references to the disposition of the scholar or reader. But what the emphasis on attention seems importantly to signal is a tendency to privilege a certain scale of attention, the encounter between individual scholar and research object, or the relation between subjects. These projects, in a way, extend the spirit of the late Foucault, painstaking analysis of forms of daily living in the classical period, and a scholarly practice that seeks to match the very esquisis it seeks to understand. The form of critical response represented by Sedgwick, by contrast, finds its power and raison d'etre precisely in the shadow cast by the suspicion it has managed to work through and beyond. As mentioned, the reparative response evolves out of the depressive position that comes in the wake of the subject's paranoid aggressions. While intersubjective relations are the template, Sedgwick is primarily interested in changing practices that reside at the cultural level, scholarly inquiry or reading, art and politics, and ideally forms of collective engagement that represent all three at once, as her valorization of a broadly conceived category of camp indicates. Moreover, the fact that Sedgwick's account in following Klein asserts the primacy of the paranoid means that the account of the system, a broad, multifaceted, anti-normative approach encompassing feminism, queerness, and Marxism, remains fundamentally intact or assumed. It is structurally present, just as the death drive that issues in the paranoid schizoid position is structurally present in Klein. What's striking about Sedgwick's use of Klein is the assumption of the fundamental importance to our more developed disciplinary, aesthetic, and political practices of very basic structuring orientations toward the world, which in this case psychoanalysis provides. This orientation raises the broad question of how different critical methods imagine the relation between the lived experience of subjects and the larger systems they inhabit. The question takes on a particular hue once we enter the era of ideologically committed subjectivity and criticism, which is to say the era in which judgments are routinely made about what view of the world often but not exclusively liberal, radical, or conservative, specific individuals hold. As the realist novel evolves, and most pointedly in the 20th century, political ideology becomes increasingly self-conscious. The ideology of criticism becomes increasingly self-conscious as well, and its understanding or staging of the relation between psychology and ideology is one of its crucial components, for reasons having to do with the concomitant rise of psychology in the 20th century. There is thus a fit between Klein and Sedgwick's critique of paranoia, just as there is a fit between Lawrence Kohlberg's stages of moral development and Habermas's theory of communicative ethics, or a fit between Freud and Lacan. To take another example, Freud's tragic view of the individual's relation to civilized life animated Lionel Trilling's bleak vision of post-war liberalism. D.W. Winnicott, a post-war British object relations psychologist, is at present attracting a lot of attention, in part be perhaps because of his focus on the ordinary and the good enough and his notion of resilience in the face of trauma. It is no accident that he is adduced in Michael Snedeker's queer optimism, for example. It's arguable, in fact, that Winnicott enjoys a special status at present as a result of a felt need to reconfigure the relation between primary practices and relations and larger political attitudes or stances. And I would you know, point you toward a, a, a very recently published book called D.W. Winnicott and Political Theory, 
recentering the subject. It was extremely interesting and has a great essay by Bonnie Honig in it. A lot of other great essays, but. What may be less visible or acknowledged is how fundamentally liberal and democratic Winnicott's orientation is, in contrast to the more radical stance of most academic left cultural criticism. In a paper written in 1950, he in fact attributed healthy citizenship within democracy to the influence of what he called ordinary good homes, contrasting such citizenship with forms of maladapted personality structures which more easily fall in with authoritarian and aggressive political agendas characteristic of wartime. Winnicott's emphasis on the importance of early development to healthy democratic or mature citizenship in fact, that's his word, mature, can be compared to the normative critical theory of Jürgen Habermas and Sheila Ben-Habib, both of whom accord importance to theories of moral development. Habermas's theory of communicative action makes appeal to individual moral development as reflective of the principles which democratic practices and institutions are meant to formalize, principles of recognition, respect, and dialogue oriented toward mutual understanding. Similarly, Sheila Ben-Habib invokes basic forms of moral education, employing lessons in perspective taking and reciprocity as the foundation of a co communicative ethics committed to interactive universalism. Interestingly then, both Winnicott and Neo-Kantians such as Habermas and Ben-Habib avow primary practices that promote healthy moral development as well as the institutional elaboration of normative political principles. This can be contrasted to Sedgwick's elaboration of a reparative response to pervasive and negative systemic forces, forces that are already in play in the early experience of the infant. The difference between Klein and Winnicott lights up the difference between the two leftist positions, the radical and the liberal. For Klein, aggression is structural, linked to the death drive, and the reparative impulse takes place in light of that primary fact. For Winnicott, Aggression is environmental, the result of trauma, and good enough parenting and other practices can serve as a crucial support in the fraught pathway to autonomy and healthy connection. The structural account has a certain fierce insistence on the negative, one we have come to associate with much radical cultural critique. The environmental account involves more optimism about the possibilities both of resilience and primary nurture. Parallel differences could be said to characterize the theoretical accounts representing the liberal and radical formations. The normative critical theorists suggest a mediated or dialectical relation between, between primary practices and political institutions. A version of splitting could be said to characterize the post-structuralist model more generally, which is characterized by unresolvable aporia in the epistemological register and unresolvable ambivalence in the psychological one. But perhaps this is an unfair way to put things, since what may be revealed above all in the difference between the liberal and radical formations is a shared ambivalence within the left, a tendency for the liberal and radical camps to define their positions against one another, and to perhaps focus more on their differences than on their common aims. The arguments for new methods in the field that focus on method and ascesis via a faithful engagement with the object of study could be said to bracket this issue. The approaches, are attentive, the approaches that are attentive to the psychological and ultimately ethical bases for our forms of criticism may be said to present a genuine opportunity to more directly confront this condition, as well as the larger question of how we conceive of human nature and human possibility, both individual and collective. Probably the most important thing to notice about Klein and Winnicott, despite their differences, is that they are both object relations theorists, even if Klein holds to the Freudian model of the drives. To invoke them is to present an altogether different way of understanding psychic life than the dominant post-structuralist psychological model the Lacanian has allowed. Indeed, the most prominent Lacanian leftist, Slavov Zizek, has used Lacanian categories to treat liberalism itself as a pathological formation, fundamentally disavowing the real of capitalism. Which is to say Zizek uses Lacanian concepts to engage in strong ideology critique and to augment the divide between the liberal and the radical left. 
The shift that the therapeutic models enact is to try to construct some sort of relation, whether mimetic or mediated, between primary relations to others and an understanding of or attitude toward the system. Both Klein and Winnicott are powerfully aware of aggression and destruction, and both view these as something we can and do respond to in, different, in constructive ways. And one could argue that the insistence on the possibilities for radical transformation of the system are belied by the Kleinian structural model, which is more universalist than constructivist, a general argument that has been leveraged against psychoanalysis more generally. Similarly, one could argue that the Winnicottian model can just as easily be recruited to a radical account of systemic harm imposed by the environment. One result of the therapeutic turn is that it might lead to a more developed debate about political psychology, which seems an increasingly pressing issue. In Sedgwick, ideological criticism, which is to say politically committed intellectual work, is understood along the model of psychology. The latter serves as the template for the former. But this does not necessarily mean that it advances our understanding of political psychology. Insofar as it is reparative, moreover, it retains a therapeutic quality, which is to say it addresses the immediate needs of the subject and its practices rather than the system itself. We see other versions of this form of redress, as for example in Rita Felsky's call for forms of reading that will promote affects and responses that are positive rather than critical and suspicious, ones that will help us move beyond affective inhibition, to use her phrase. The attempts to articulate the relation between psychology and ideology, by contrast, may help to deepen our ability to explain how we imagine political life and its possibilities. The therapeutic model tends to signal either a significantly contracted scale of attention or a starting premise that the system, neoliberalism, capitalism, surrounds us and exerts a debilitating pressure against our possibilities of effective response. The therapeutic model also shares significant overlap with affect studies, although they are by no means re reducible to one another. Sedgwick's essay is, of course, as trained upon introducing the work of affect theorist Sylvan Tompkins as it is on applying Klein. Berlant's cruel optimism also aligns itself with affect studies. Broadly speaking, the work in affect studies often seeks to understand the politics of affect in a way that encompasses and acknowledges both subjective experience and the larger system. But the key question is how precisely it does so. Berlant states that her book, quote, observes forces of subjectivity laced through with structural causality, but tries, this is still Berlant, but tries to avoid the closures of symptomatic reading that would turn the objects of cruel optimism into bad and oppressive things, and the subjects of cruel optimism into emblematic symptoms of economic, political, and cultural inequity. I just think the really important thing about that quote is the laced through, at the very beginning, subjects laced through with structural causality. In her study of the negative emotions, Sian Nai aims to capture both the ideological dimensions and the critical productivity of the affects under study precisely without promoting, quote, their countervalorization as a therapeutic solution to the problems they condense. And in Jameson's The Antinomies of Realism, affect is considered in varying ways, as a channel for aesthetic ideologies, Zola, and as a re-energizing textual effect that constrain realism beyond its limit, Tolstoy, or promote the undoing of binaries, Eliot. This is the last paragraph. What the therapeutic model lights up is the limiting ways in which many of the paradigms in the field have conceived the psychology of the subject under the conditions of modernity or within the symbolic structure. Associating individual subjectivity with drives to mastery, sovereignty, paranoid aggression, and deluded attachments has in some sense collapsed systemic forces into the subject and limited critical self-awareness to the registration of these effects or the post hoc acknowledgement or redress of them. Berlant's study may be the most illuminating instance of this formation. The title itself, Cruel Optimism, houses a disorienting collapse of reference with respect to the system and the subject, 
The system is cruel. The optimism is diluted. This is fundamentally a collapse of scales of attention then. In lighting up the question of scale, however, the therapeutic model functions as both a symptom and an opportunity, as it brings to the fore the question of how our most basic relations and practices, including our early development, might condition and enable our engagement with social and political life. Our disciplinary history of the past 50 years has privileged certain psychoanalytic models over others and articulated them primarily in relation to strong forms of negative systems critique. Rather than turning away from systems critique to more modest critical practices defined above all through method and the accompanying stance of the practitioner, it might be worth rethinking altogether the psychology that we imagine in relation to the system. Thank you. Okay, um, we have about 25 minutes uh, for questions, um, so I would ask you please to keep your questions brief so we can have as many of them as possible, of course. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah. Is that okay? Just as a, just mm -hmm. something I wanted to respond to because I had just read the Kramnik and Narcessian too, and actually before you, <laughs> sure before, you before you, yeah, I was like, what's, what are they going to say? Um, but um, I actually wrote those words down before, or their names. Sorry, uh, I wrote their names down before you said them because I was like, this is making me think about that. But one of the interesting arguments they make in there, which I think I heard you say uh, when you were suggesting we do need dis distance diagnostic criticism is because it's such an important part of the kind of tradition of, the, the, of novel criticism or history of the novel or the novel. Um, and that's one of the interesting ways that they make their argument, which is to say, certain features of disciplinary practice, we don't actually have to kind of scout, you know, endlessly scour why we're doing them or what's, what's the reason we're doing them because they are part of a discipline. We can recognize our own competency and in a kind of pragmatist way just move forward, which I think is a, it's a kind of fascinating moment. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, part of the way I, part of the reason that your talk is so profound for me is because, uh, you know, something that seemed like maybe a kind of more, um, uh, easily assimilable thing in my life, which was being like a queer literary critic. I have felt as a split, I would say, um, over, you know, since I got a job basically um, and sort of became, became part of the world because I think the question is of like, when they make that move of saying like, this is what the discipline has always been, it's like, I often feel like I'm living in kind of a different discipline with, and, and I do think that just, you know, we don't really, we can't really go into this, but I do think the question of the sort of hyper exemplarity of of queer scholarship in relation to so many of these questions <laughs> is remarkable. Um, and so what is it about the sort of specificity of field formation in queer studies that has made it so deeply implicated in each of these questions? I, I may be seeing that from my own point of view, but I, I really do feel like there's a, something going on there. Yeah, I'll just say briefly uh, before we get to audience questions that, you know, uh, what you just said made me realize I could have, yeah, just as easily foregrounded queer studies as novel studies in saying, you know, in, in, in talking about like what the, what's key to this story. So thank you for that. Vina, right next. To Vina, please, first, yeah. Um, thank you, very, um, very stimulating papers. Um, I, I have a question about uh, this issue about smallness and largeness. Um, that is, and it's addressed to both of you, which is that if in a way one thought of a mirrorological rather than Euclidean kinds of uh, spaces, um, then the distinction between parts and holes becomes much more difficult, right? So when Tinbergen is saying, um, that the concentration on, on, on the small will, will you know, lead to not knowing what the whole looks like. But the point is that if the larger institutions are actually always present in, you know, but in a different modality than if you were to, if I study the state through the ways in which people write petitions or 
you know, uh, uh, get called upon by the state and so on, versus if I concentrate on, let's say, studying in a bureaucrat's office, what, the, what they're doing over there. Um, I do get a particular picture of the state. It's a different picture than the one that would come if I had this very clear idea that larger means inclusion of the smaller in the larger. Larger means what? Sorry? Inclusion of the small? Is that what, larger means inclusion of the small? Um, no, the point is that if the larger is not in the, if the smaller is not in the larger, because that assumes a classes and members kind of notion, mm -hmm. whereas a mirrorological understanding would assume that you don't have, you know, types and tokens or classes or sets and members and so on, but that there is a sense in which the whole and the part move into each other. Um, would you not then begin to think, um, I'm, myself, I'm not clear about it totally, I'm just, um, yeah, uh, you know, I've been one thinking about this. So would you then not think that questions of description would be attuned in a certain sense to the idea of, you know, of the holes and parts moving into each other all the time? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think I, how I learned how to read would be um, exactly what you cited from Berlant, which is the kind of individual subject laced through by structural forces, right? So, um, of course, the unit of analysis is something like the novel. Um, and so, um, you know, we're kind of looking at how um, these larger forces are, you know, then there's a bunch of different ways to make those connections, but that's basically I think kind of the way many of us learn, learn to read. Um, I've been interested in um, the kind of artificial um, and very marked um, imposition of a, of a frame. Let's say for Tinbergen it would be like, you know, the three foot by three foot grid, right? Like that kind of sense of the frame um, or, you know, Goffman's choice of um, the interaction order, right, whatever you can see or hear in a space, kind of as an experiment um, with different forms of analysis and perception more than a kind of like call to arms, frankly, um, which is to say what, what would it be to kind of um, accept that like every literary critic isn't necessarily going to solve the structure agency problem um, and that <laughs> that it's okay to stay small, right? I'm better actually at sort of looking at the kind of microdynamics in a, in a scene of interaction in a novel than I am at political economy, like very clearly I'm better at one thing than the other. Um, so I've been kind of interested in sort of just sticking with the micro and, you know, and that's, that is why the kind of ethos of like humility, you know, which I, I live as a kind of like, you know, explain your method um, kind of a set of choice, rhetorical choices in everyday life about how to explain what I'm doing. I'm actually interested in kind of, as much as we want to critique, you know, the ideology of modesty, I, I think that's a, like an interesting experiment to, to kind of, um, or that's how I've been pursuing it. Yeah, I didn't hear the word that you, did you say phenomenological? No, what? Medieval, first there was the medieval ontology in which parts and goals oh, okay. Okay. were well. into each other, and then there's a form of mathematics. Well, I do think, <laughs> okay, so I mean, obviously, um, my talk uh, worked through an opposition between sort of a systemic perspective and then a more sort of situated perspective, whether that's of the practitioner or thinking through. Um, lived experience and intersubjective relations, um, moral development, psychological development. I do uh, think that when you are, and I'm, and I'm also very, very interested in the relation between self-conscious ideology and psychology as it's sort of worked out in, in the history of the novel and the political novel. Um, I do think when you're describing experience and forms of power, that you, you know, one needs to get away from that kind of stark uh, binary that was part of a kind of argument structure in my paper. And that when you're describing, you know, the experience within institutions, as for example, you know, Caroline Levine uh, talks about this in her book Forms, where she brings in all these new sociological accounts of institutions that are more fluid in the way that you're describing and more granular in their, their scaling. Um, 
I, I entirely agree with you. So I would just make the distinction sort of between the analytic there and, uh, you know, I don't know, the practical. Yeah. You can, um, maybe just go in pairs. So with your question, then I believe Toral, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. But, well, and then to. Okay. All right, well then we'll go to um, Elizabeth and just behind Elizabeth as well. So please. Um, he is. Okay. Yes. So my question or comment is uh, um, for Heather. I wasn't quite clear on what you were up to with the description versus theory division and kind of what your vision for what you're actually doing uh, moving forward is. It sounded to me a little bit like um, you're a certain kind of ethnographer, um, drawing inspiration from Anand Singh. But I, I wasn't totally clear on how to listen to your paper. In other words, was this a was this theory? Was it description? Is theory ever without description? I mean, this is description ever without theory? One of the points that um, Kathy Lutz's paper about gender and theory makes is mm -hmm. that there are all kinds of presuppositions that we have about what theory is. And so I tried to listen to your paper as in either of them, and I wasn't really sure what um, kind of descriptive work was going on here. You seem to be promoting description, but is it a description of other people's descriptions that we're after, or a description of the prim primary kind of mode, the naturalist mode of being in the world? Um, so yeah. I, I know that I you're I, in, working I, in, yeah. Can I think I get the question, because yeah. um, it's something that it's, I actually have people ask me. Um, because, uh, yeah, I, I think when I started doing this project, I was like, oh, I'm going to come up with like a new method for literary st studies, um, speaking of humility. Um, and I was like, oh, I want to try to practice kind of descriptive readings of literature. And I think there are people out there doing that. Like, I think, you know, and this is sort of my attraction to the surface reading essay is about a kind of actually survey of work that I think sort of falls into that category, like bibliographic textual criticism would be like an example. And I kind of tried to do that in Close But Not Deep with a reading of Beloved. I think it fails. It's not a description. And basically, part of what this project has been about, working through it, has been like the kind of insistence of, um, like the discipline is the discipline, the insistence of the reading, the ha reading habits of, that I learned, you know, in college, basically, right? The sort of, you know, my kind of attraction to close reading. So I think, and also, like, I'm a theorist, basically. So I'm basically like a theorist advocating on behalf of empirical descriptive work. So yes, that is maybe hypocritical or like a contradiction, but that is, that is what I'm, that is what I'm doing. Um, but I think, yeah, as it's progressed, it's sort of like I'm doing readings of description in literary texts and sociological and other, other like human sciences um, I'm sort of describing the way they describe rather than um, really doing description. But I think the other thing to say is that another question I often get is like, what description is already interpretation, which I think we know that very well. Mm -hmm. And so in these kind of pairings, like, um, which I think are often seen as kind of um, binary, like toggle switches, like is it interpretation or description? Is it description or theory? I just want to make a general point, which is that I think it doesn't have to be either or, and that what we're really talking about is actually rhetoric, and um, that we can recognize a certain kind of account as more descriptive or more interpretive without saying, like, oh, I believe in ultimate objectivity or something, right? Like, um, and so it's partly about the kind of trying to understand the aims of these writers, I think, who, you know, Tinbergen and his circle, um, who I think, you know, for very well thought out reasons, were trying to um, be more descriptive without a kind of ideology of objectivity. Uh, Toril, do you want to? Uh, yeah. Elizabeth has the mic. Uh, oh, yeah, you do too. Okay. Well, they both have them. Okay, uh, so first of all, just on description, I do want to say, I think, of course I think that Wittgenstein's notion of description is relevant here, which is simply, for him, description which he used, okay, you have a philosophical problem and you don't have one unless you feel confused about something. So you, you're lo a philosophical problem has the form, I don't know my way about is the phrase. The answer to that, 
trying to find your way about is essentially description. That undercuts the theory description opposition or the theory empiricism opposition that a lot of other theories operate with because th there are reasons for that that I won't go into. So I'm just saying, and also I want to say you don't have to accept that interpretation is always there of interpretations role in our intellectual operations is probably overestimated, but I won't go there either. I have a question for both of you, very simple. I know you started by mentioning novel theory, and Heather, I know your project is also very interested in literature. Now, essentially, I take both of your papers to be part of the dismantling of the post-structuralist legacy in many ways, a, a dismantling I wholeheartedly support. So, but. Both of you, and one of the problems with the legacy that's being dismantled is that it has tended to, paradoxically, to make huge political claims for literature. You read novels and suddenly it's all about capitalism or the economy or something. And I'm not saying, and there's you know, a real emphasis on allegorical readings of one kind or another, that this plot symbolizes the post-colonial situation or something or the queer uh, predicament or whatever. And my question for you all is how do your laudatory theoretical interventions here play out with the, now you say you return to the reading of literature, novels or other genres. What would you do now that you didn't do before you wrote these papers as it were? What kind of practices would you, will we now engage in in relation to literature? I'm probably looking for your utopian visions here. Well, you mean of practice? Because I don't have a utopian vision. But um, um, the two things I would say. I mean, you know, the, uh, the book that uh, just appeared, Bleak Liberalism, is about um, a whole series of novelistic engagements with liberal thought through realism and modernism, um, which, are, which uh, dislodge the longstanding tendency to see the novel as somehow um, yoked to an emergent uh, bourgeois ideology of liberalism and sort of helping to form uh, liberal subjects, but rather showed a series of writers who were actively um, and actively and and often skeptically engaging uh, the promise of liberalism uh, through through complex uses of form, most uh, notably. Uh, dynamics between first and third perspective and uses of argument uh, through form. Um, and I have, um, in, the, in the forthcoming book called Psyche and Ethos, I do have, so, I do have a Winnicottian reading of uh, George Eliot. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's just a different way of kind, I mean, what, what I think this paper and what some of the work in that, um, in that short forthcoming book uh, is about is turning toward the question of um, psychological development and moral development, which I'm uh, increasingly interested in and think can't really be avoided, or no, it cannot, can't, it shouldn't be avoided. This, uh, this notion of the, how we think about the, the relation between primary practices um, and our social life and our political aspirations. Um, and I think that, you know, I was a Habermasian from, you know, long, long ago, all alone out there, at least in literature. <laughs> and um, um, I used to just sort of skip all the pages about moral development and Lawrence Kohlberg. I was like, oh, this is horrible. I can't read about this. I'll just read about, you know, the intercolonization of the life world and communicative reason. Um, but now I'm like, not that I'm a Kohlbergian, not even remotely, but I, but I, not, but I am really interested in that now. And I think that was a really uh, important and, um, important dimension of, you know, that systems theory, so. Um, well, I think my aims for reading in this particular book project are not particularly utopian. It really does have to do with trying to kind of think about small worlds in the novel and some of the stuff we were talking about last night in terms of like troubling the distinction between real and fictional worlds and kind of thinking about the work of novelists as kind of a kind of microsociology and the work of reading novels is a kind of microsociology in a sense and it's you know it's about the details and about these this kind of ecological sense of interaction which i i find so powerfully 
in this work from mid-century. Um, my more utopian thing, I think, does have to do with trying to gain freedom for um, different kinds of reading practices. Um, and, you know, I think the kind of one's discontent with the profession is ultimately probably kind of boring and better kept to yourself, right? It's like um, often so problematic as it's articulated. But, you know, part of the reason that I was drawn to queer studies was because of the incredible freedom that I saw modeled in a work like Paranoid and Reparative Reading. I mean, I just couldn't believe, I still can't believe the kind of things that happen in that essay. It's incredible. Um, and I think I wanted access to that freedom in a sense that, you know, that was the kind of thing that made me want to be a professor, that other stuff didn't make me want to be a professor. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 you know, whatever, it's aging and stuff, but feeling the rigidification of um, what's you know, possible to say, and like I remember the first time I gave some work on, um, on on Guffman. I think I had like three different people, kind of senior colleagues in my field, come up to me after the talk and say, like, you really can't do this. <laughs> um, so that, of course, made me want to do it um, more, <laughs> even more. Um, but you know, I think experiments are exciting. They're also like dangerous, right? Because of the sort of unintended consequences. I was just reading, rereading uh, Ruth Bahar's Vulnerable Observer, where she talks about seeing the young woman breaking down in tears, who's like, who starts her talk by saying, you know, this talk is inspired by your work, your kind of example of doing more autobiographical criticism, but then the woman can't finish the talk. And Bahar is like, horrified, basically. She's like, what have I done, or whatever, right? So, I mean, I'm, but I'm interested in exploring that kind of zone of freedom. I mean, this is why your kind of um, incredible bird's eye view on what's going on is so helpful to me, because I often feel like I'm sort of just in it. <laughs> About um, 10 minutes, so I'd just like to group some questions. So Elizabeth, I believe there's a question just behind you, then Tim, is that the first set, please? Okay, I have two, uh, thank you, both. Um, Heather, just a quick question. When you're talking about the specificity of modes of observation, what would you do, um, how would you account for structures of address? Um, for the natural historian, I'm not sure what the structure of address would be. Certainly for the literary critic, a structure of address would be something quite specific. Um, and, and Amanda, um, I really liked your paper. I really liked your formulation of, of where Sedgwick's work is in relation to the other texts that, that you cited. I think that the, your whole... Um, your whole rendering of the therapeutic is, is, is really interesting. My only question is, is there room for an other of the therapeutic that isn't just lumped over into the, into the systemic? Um, you're certainly right that Lacanianism is not therapeutic, but neither are certain aspects of Winnicott or um, any of the psychoanalysts. If, if we want to look at something that is on a different register from the therapeutic, namely the um, epistemological or political impossibility, um, the, the intractability of the unconscious. I mean, I, I, I would be reluctant to reduce the death drive in Lacan to um, Zizek. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, there are other ways of thinking about it. So I was just curious if, if that would be of interest, that there is an other of the therapeutic that is not in the register of the therapeutic at all. Mm. Elizabeth, could you uh, pass the mic behind you, please? Thank you both. Um, my question actually comes from the first exchange. Professor Love, I was really struck when you said, you know, what is it about the sort of queerness or, of novel studies? And so this question is really to Professor Anderson, thinking about um, when you first started with therapeutic criticism, I thought you were going to talk about, or I was hoping you were talking about criticism as it is therapeutic also, as a way of writing the body into thought. And um, thinking about criticism emerging from something like the black radical tradition or women of color feminists who say we have to theorize, we have to enter into thought. Um, because we haven't been in thought before, right? Or Fanon ending black skin, white masks, saying, oh, my body, always make of me one who thinks, or make of me one who questions, right? So I'm thinking aloud with you or trying to think with you about the position in which criticism can be therapeutic or can produce a subject that is 
um, comforted or held or hugged. Okay, Tim? <laughs> you didn't feel that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I want, thank you very much. Um, can I, can, I, I, I guess I want to ask about the differences between your two papers. And um, um, Amanda, you talked of Sedgwick and you know, of the shadow cast by the suspicion that her work, uh, the suspicion that uh, uh, the effective has managed to work through and work beyond. In other words, there's a kind of corrective element to your, your um, paper. There's a certain kind of dominance of, of, of effect studies that you want to, it seems to me, um, correct in some sense or realign some realignment. Heather, there's something structurally similar, but I think the, the terms are opposed. So if I, you know, using Amanda's formulation, you know, you, you, it seems to me that you have a sense of the shadow cast by the descriptive that theory has managed to work through and move beyond. In other words, there, there's a, there's the, we're in a, in a situation of the dominance of the theoretical by implication, you want a certain kind of realignment, um, but it, you, but each of you has a different idea of what is dominant. You know, for Amanda, it is the affective, and for Heather, it is the theoretical. At least this is, this is certainly how you both got into your papers. And um, I, I, so I want to just ask you: um, Is that all where? Is that all that's at stake in your two papers? A certain, that you're both in some sense in agreement, I mean certainly the, the Q&A has sort of emphasized a, a certain kind of agreement between you and the need for a certain kind of rebalancing. Torrell Moy's question, uh, real, I mean also emphasized a certain similarity in terms of a dismantling of the post-structural legacy. Clearly that's a kind of dominant moment. Uh, Aren't we, aren't we about due for a recovery of the dismant of the post-structuralist legacy? It makes me, it makes me think. So in other words, could you say, Tim, could, we just could you each say, each say a little bit more about what you are actually, you know, something um, about the stakes for you of your, res of, of, of your respective um, terms? Maybe description for Heather, maybe it's suspicion for Amanda, but, but in, in other words, rather than just a, a sort, of, sort of rebalancing. So we're just going to answer all three of those. Yeah. And that's each. and that's it. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You go first. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Elizabeth. Um, that's a great question. It's a hard question. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I mean, I, there are things that are intractable and difficult and unresolvable and. In the unconscious, I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I don't deny the unconscious. Um, so yeah, I think that's I, that's something to think about. I, you know, so I just like I thank you for that question, um, and I also just like the way way you put it. Um, something like the an other of the therapeutic, because it's it's true that the therapeutic in my paper is both critical and neutral, right? So, um, but the question is, you know, is there, what isn't encompassed, especially in the neutral version, right? Um, Lakshmi, okay, uh, so you didn't feel comforted and held by that form, <laughs> I get, I'm getting that, okay. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think of myself as a pluralist um, when it comes to criticism, so the kinds of things that I'm trying to identify, I could see, um, uh, being enacted or actualized or explored in all sorts of different um, ways and from different positions and through different forms of commitments and, and interests. So what I'm most interested in is kind of like a capacious understanding of the relation between, you know, in its most sort of broadest formulation, lived experience and political aspiration. Um, so, but, but you're talking about something really important. You're kind of, you're talking about form and you're talking about the effects of form. You're talking about voice. And um, I, that's just something that I think, given the nature of this paper, it's sort of, you know, meta action, um, doesn't really get, uh, yeah, ain't there. But uh, so thank you for that is all. I mean, again, I think that's a, like a really terrific question. Tim, oh God. Um, okay. so. <laughs> Um, 
Well, I was trying to think as you were speaking, um, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do is uh, say that there's, there's more than one way to think about um, the effect of systemic critique or the, you know, the dimensions of systemic critique so that, so that it needn't simply be viewed as paranoid or suspicious mm -hmm. and disabling. Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so I think that you know, one, of the things I was so, I, one of the things I was so struck by in Heather's paper was the sort of maybe the last quarter of it um, where she talked about, um, you, you sort of talked about, you know, like a dark view of the world as, you know, in a kind of observer stance that was one of critique and that was attuned to harm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, witnessing of violence, right? Um, and that just struck me as really, really, uh, like powerfully resonant with, with what I was talking about. And I'm, you know, in no way trying to say that most systemic critique is noting bad things, right? It's, it, right, that just like, it doesn't usually go, look at this great system, you know, like, I mean, sometimes it does, but uh, that's not the kind I'm in favor of. Um, but there's a difference between that and the kind, and, and the, the force of a certain form of, of negative critique that, um, um, wants that always to be first and ineluctable, right? You know, like neoliberalism is everywhere. Um, so, and, that, and it, has, it has consequences for how we think about so many of the things that people have been attending to in this conference, which is practices on a smaller scale, right? Um, and I think that, you know, Sergio, I think really kind of, um, I mean, his paper I thought really lit this up as well. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I didn't. I saw a lot of, of um, overlap, and I, you know, I, I don't. I don't think that. I think that I'm trying to say the scales have to be thought in relation to one another, mm -hmm. and that you know my tendency is dialectical, not negative dialectic. Okay, um, Elizabeth, about um, address structures of address. I mean, the thing is about um, practices of description is that they're often quite boring. Um, so probably the, the main project at the heart of this book is this natural history of an interview project that was, you know, took 15 years and um, yielded a document that was like 700 pages of description of a 10 minute film clip, right? Um, so it's this, you know, really over the top description, it's never published, um, it's on microfilm at the University of Chicago. Um, and no one really wanted to read it. Um, and um, Bateson, Gregory Bateson was involved in the project. He's one of the charismatic individuals who's involved at the beginning of the project. He writes like this beautiful introductory essay quoting Rilke and stuff, right? And then when they get down to the coding, he's out of there, right? He's like, I've got other stuff to do besides like spend like 10 years um, just coding frame by frame what's happening in this movie, right? So, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I think along with like, I'm a theorist arguing for empiricism, it's like, I'm interested in descriptive practices, but I'm drawn to, you know, these beautiful, gorgeous passages in Tinbergen or Goffman, who, you know, I deeply admire as a stylist, right? So it's like, there's a bit of cherry picking around that, but, um, but I actually do do a lot of work on these collaborative projects and the, the address that I'm interested in in there mostly is that um, it's a structure of collaboration and it's actually quite, I think, utopian and help me to understand, I think, to re-see certain kinds of scientific values of, say, verifiability, falsifiability, because basically, in the natural history of an interview, it's like 15 people have to come to an agreement about what's happening on screen, right? And to have a psychoanalyst and a, you know, somebody who studies non-verbal um, communication, that's an interesting conversation, right? Frida from Lichtman's like, we haven't, we haven't accounted for the unconscious, right? This is the question of, can you see the unconscious? And they're like, oh, Frida, you know, we love you. Like, yes, we have to account for the unconscious. Can you just show us where that is on the tape, right? And these conversations, that's what's in the archive for that project. So I'm interested in how they figure out ways to talk to each other. And it does seem like kind of a model for interdisciplinarity with all the friction that that implies when you actually get down to those real differences. Um, Tim? <laughs> You really, you really did it this time. Um, I actually, I think I'll just, you know, I know we're out of time probably, um, and I think I probably want to kind of ally my talk with Helen's if she won't resist that, because I'm interested in what might be effective 
um, kind of arguments for the discipline, and it's partly about literary studies for me, as I keep like showing. It's really always about queer studies for me, and you know, I just hear a lot of anecdotal evidence, like, oh, I wanted to do a project on a dissertation on queer studies. My advisor told me that was so 90s, right? So, <clears throat> you know, so I end up advising that project at a different university, right? I mean, this is the these are the facts on the ground. And so part of what I did in the differences piece on history of deviant studies was try to think about how queer theory's emergence around 1990, kind of at the high moment of post-structuralism, meant that it's been the identitarian field that's been willing to do without an object, without subject matter, without a kind of determinate politics. And I think it's really hurt it over time, right? We never had gay and lesbian studies. We just kind of fast forwarded to queer studies with its dissolving object. And I, th I think, you know, it hasn't institutionalized um, resource, you know, it's very prestigious, but also really um, the infrastructure is not there, and I'm very aware of that. Um, so I'm trying to think about, um, this, this is not a new formalist argument for description. It's really about the kind of ethics of avowing that you have an object. This is something that anthropology has had to wrestle with, and I think has done a really good job of doing that. But um, the sort of like disappearing object, I think, has not allowed us to reckon with the kind of inevitable ethical compromises of having an object of study. I think that's true in, in literary studies to a certain degree, a kind of stripe of literary studies, but it's really, really true in queer studies. All right, thank you. Um, we need to break now for lunch, um, and we'll be back 1.30 for our next panel. Um, but please join me in thanking our panelists.